Hello and warm greetings to you at this special season of the year. I come to you in the name of the one of whom it was prophesied that his name would be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. For a few minutes on this special day, I'd like to think with you about six miracles of Bethlehem. And the first one, has to do with the stars directing. In Matthew chapter 2, we read these words in verses 1 and 2. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men, that's the word magi, from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star and have come to worship him. Now, my father was in the Royal Air Force during the Second World War, and they didn't have all the fancy navigational equipment they have now, and they actually used the stars to get direction. And they would triangulate, and when they had three stars fixed, they had a dead reckoning position. They knew where they were based on the stars. And of course, for centuries, people have used the stars for guidance. But this is a fascinating miracle, this wonderful star that led these wise men from the east right to the very house where the Lord and Mary and Joseph were. When we go back uh, in our Bibles 1,500 years before the birth of Christ, we come to the days of Balaam. And in Numbers chapter 24 and verse 17, Balaam, seeking to curse the people of God, was reprogrammed so that a blessing came out. And this blessing read, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel. And so this man, who interestingly enough, the Bible tells us, came from Pethor, which was a, a town on the Euphrates River in the land of Babylon in Mesopotamia, he had prophesied concerning a star that was linked to a king, a star and a scepter. And uh, you will recall how he was told to go back to his land, but in, instead he stayed with the Midianites and he ended up dying there with the enemy. Although he said he wanted to die the death of the righteous, the scripture says he loved the wages of unrighteousness and as a result he perished. However, the story of Balaam has continued through the centuries, and in fact, the New Testament records the story of Balaam uh, and the lesson from it. A, a thousand years passes, and we come to the court of Nebuchadnezzar. And he comes in one morning into the office, and he says to all of these magi, these fortune tellers and Chaldeans that are on his payroll, uh, I had a dream the other night and I can't remember what it was. I want you to tell me the dream and tell me what it means. And they said, now, King, come on, that's not how you do this. You tell us the dream, we'll tell you what it means. I think he had the sneaking suspicious that, that these people were, were fakes. And so he lays down the law and he says, look, I'm the king, I make the rules. If you don't do this, I'm gonna chop you in pieces. And of course they, confess. Only the gods can prophesy. There's not a man in all the world that can do that. But Daniel hears about it and comes to the palace and explains that the Lord knows the dream of Nebuchadnezzar and if he's given the evening to spend with God, God can reveal it to him. And sure enough, that's what happens. And because of this, Daniel is the man that God uses to spare these magi in the east, in Babylon, and the king puts Daniel over the Magi to be their administrator. Now, the, these stories, of course, that have to do with the Magi also involve the prophecy of Daniel. Now, Daniel, in uh, chapter 9, verses 24 to 26, explains exactly when the Messiah was going to come. 490 years was going to be this chapter in Israel's history, but the last seven years were going to be delayed, called the time of Jacob's trouble, the, the time of the Great Tribulation. So there were uh, 490 years minus the seven. And 
when this is calculated from Nehemiah chapter 2, the dedic rededication of the altar in the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem until Messiah was cut off but not for himself, they could calculate the actual time of the coming of the Messiah. And Sir Robert Anderson has done us a great favor in his book, The Coming Prince, giving us the math, if you will, that explains exactly how this could be calculated. Now, Job talks about the Maseroth, the circle of the stars. And interestingly, that phrase, the Maseroth, referring to the constellations that sometimes people refer to as the zodiac, that phrase, the circle of the stars, the Maseroth, actually means a garland of crowns. And uh, there have been books written by um, Seiss and uh, Bullinger and, and uh, Ken Fleming explaining the gospel in the stars. And in fact, the well-known passage in Psalm 19 that begins with the heavens declare the glory of God goes on to say, there's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their sound has gone out throughout all the earth and their words to the end of the world. This is referring to God's message in the stars. And when we get to Romans chapter 10, the Apostle Paul asked the question, regarding people, have they not heard? Is that the problem, that people haven't heard? And then he quotes these verses and says, no, they have heard. Their message has gone out into all the earth. And so while we live in a culture that hardly looks at the stars, many of these ancient societies were guided by the stars. And while much of the astronomy slipped into astrology, as with these magi, Yet there seemed to be a serious seeking after the plan of God, the will of God, and it was revealed. And so we understand that the Lord Jesus was born under the sign of the Virgin and died under the sign of the Ram. And so um, we have this story of these men who come from the East, a Magi, and they evidently understood this prophecy concerning the star and the scepter and they saw the star and they began their long journey coming to Jerusalem. Now what's remarkable of course is they make a little detour to the king's palace and the king also has his uh, rent to prophets if you will, these Jewish leaders, and he asked them the question, where's Messiah to be born? And without getting out their concordance or their Bible software, immediately they give the answer. Quoting Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. And yet not one of them got on his donkey and rode the four miles just over the hill of Rachel, Ramat Rahel, to Bethlehem to find out if it was true. And yet these Gentiles had traveled halfway across the known world to find the king of the Jews. And indeed they did. And they brought their gold, frankincense, and myrrh to him. And so this is the first of the great miracles of Bethlehem, the stars directing and then secondly, <coughs> the angelic proclamation. We read of the, the angels here in Luke chapter 2, and uh, reading from verse 8, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Don't be afraid. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. And it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. So the second great miracle at Bethlehem was the revelation of the good news concerning the Savior that was brought to a few shepherds. Imagine this, this glorious display of angelic beings not given to the leaders in Jerusalem, not given to royalty, given to shepherds. After all, who else would be interested 
in a little lamb being born in Bethlehem's stable. And so the Lamb of God slipped into the world, hardly noticed, and yet these angelic beings revealed the truth to these shepherds. We discover that Gabriel uh, predicted the birth of the Savior to Mary. And then uh, it was proclaimed here to the shepherds. And then the angels gave word to Joseph. They protected him by sending Joseph uh, with the child Jesus down to Egypt uh, to uh, avoid the, the slaughter of the innocents by Herod. And then the angels provided for the Lord after his temptation. They strengthened him. They ministered to him. And then we discover that they pronounced him risen from the dead at the tomb. And finally, uh, they prodded the disciples into action after his ascension. Why do you stand gazing? It's time to get to work. And so these six revelations of the angels ministering to the Lord uh, throughout his life. And so these beautiful words in 1 Timothy 3.16, he was seen of angels. Why, in the presence of God, they covered their faces. And with what amazement they would have watched their creator, their God, the one they worshiped, being made the song of a drunkard, being spit upon and abused. And as the Lord Jesus said to his disciples as they panicked in those last days, as, they, as he faced the cross and he said, um, don't you think that I could now ask my father and he could give me more than 12 legions of angels? And so the angels were there at every turn caring for and ministering to the Lord Jesus. And so this is another great miracle, the miracle of the declaration, uh, not simply good wishes. We, we offer good wishes to people, but God offers goodwill. He wills good to the human race, goodwill towards men. And then number three, uh, we have the virgin's conception. In Isaiah 7, verse 14, we read, The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. So there was the sign of the star. And then we read here, there was the sign of the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. This will be a sign to you. And now we have the sign of the virgin conceiving. This is, of course, in fulfillment to the very first promise, what is called the Proto-Evangelon, where we read uh, that the seed of the woman would come and bruise the serpent's head. You know, back in Job 14 and verse 4, Job asked the question, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? And here is the Lord Jesus, born into the human race, where every other member of the human race is born in sin. But he was born sinless. That holy thing which shall be born of you shall be called the Son of God. Now, the virgin conception, of course, the birth was natural. It was his conception that was supernatural. And, and when we think about the, the virgin birth, we, we ask the question, why is it so important? Well, if we go back to Jeremiah 22 and verse 30, we read that God became so angry with the second last king in the Old Testament, Jeconiah or Coniah, that he said, none of his descendants shall prosper sitting on the throne of David and ruling anymore. And so God had promised that David and his line would continue forever on the throne. Of course, referring to the Lord Jesus. But here now, God, as it were, cuts off the royal line. He says to Jeconiah, if you were my royal signet, I'd tear you off and throw you away. So the question is, how could God maintain the curse on Jeconiah? The only king of Judah after Jeconiah was his younger brother. But none of his seed, none of his children, his grandchildren, would ever reign on the throne. So how could God fulfill his promise to David and yet maintain the curse on Jeconiah? The virgin conception is the only way. If the Jews won't have Jesus, there's no other king of the Jews that qualifies. We have two genealogies, one in Matthew, one in Luke. 
The genealogy of Matthew is his legal genealogy, and it comes down through David, through Jeconiah, to Joseph. That means that Joseph and all his children would be disqualified, his physical children would be disqualified because of the curse on Jeconiah. In Luke, we have Mary's genealogy. Of course, Joseph stands in for her, but we have Mary's genealogy, and her line comes through David and then sidesteps Jeconiah. So that physically, none of Mary's children would qualify to be the king because they were not in the official line. So the only arrangement that would work is if this personage would have his physical lineage through David, but avoid the curse on Jeconiah, but have his legal lineage through Joseph so that he is in the official line. And so the Lord Jesus legally gets his right through Joseph, physically is not disqualified by the curse on Jeconiah. The only way that God could fulfill both the curse on Jeconiah and the promise to David. Emmanuel, God with us. The fourth great miracle then is the incarnate revelation. We read in 1 Timothy 3.16, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. What a strange thing that people would dare to suggest that the Bible never gives Jesus the, the claim of being God. Why, everywhere we turn. We read in 2 Corinthians 5.19, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. In John 1.1, 1, 1, the Word was God. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. In Hebrews 1.8, to the Son, he says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Colossians 2.9, in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I hope we never lose the wonder of this. The one of whom it is said, the heaven of heavens cannot contain him. That earth is a, a footstool to him. That he can measure the heavens with a span. That this one somehow found a way to become our size. They say that man is about halfway between the subatomic particles and the supernovas. And somehow the creator of this massive universe, who spoke it into being in a few moments of time, was willing to come into time and, and bear with humanity, us little creatures. If you get out in, into space a few miles, you can hardly notice the difference between me and an amoeba. A speck of dust on a speck of dust in the corner of God's universe. And yet, it was for those little creatures that Christ came and died at Calvary. When I was a boy, um, we would always be asked to bring a shoebox to school. And uh, you would cut a little window in the one end, and then you would cut a, a light hole in the top, and you would build what they called a diorama, a little world inside the shoebox. And uh, being from Canada, we would use cotton to uh, make it look like snow. We'd get little twigs and they'd become trees and little pebbles would become boulders. And we'd put a few little figurines in there and we'd look into the little world we'd made. But none of us would ever think of wanting to move into that world, that restrictive little box. And yet this is what our God has done. He came near to us. He visited this planet. He came into humanity. Oh, Christian, may we rejoice in the truth that God did not leave it to man to find his way up to God, but came to where we were and humbled himself and took the form entering into humanity itself so that he might reveal to us God in flesh. So that we might know what would God do at a funeral or a wedding? How would he treat a prostitute or a tax collector? What would he do with little children who seem to be disturbing the conversation? In every picture, we have this beautiful manifestation of the character of God. And as Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. 
And then number five, we have the ordained location. The prophecy fulfilled in the birth of Christ at Bethlehem. Back in Micah chapter 5, 2, we read, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you're little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. In Matthew chapter 1, we have how he came. In Matthew chapter 2, we have where he came. In Matthew 1, we see that he was both the Son of God and the Son of Mary, a supernatural conception, a natural birth. But when we come to Matthew chapter 2, there are four seemingly contradictory prophecies. That he would be born in Bethlehem, that he would come out of Egypt, that he would be called a Nazarene, and that they would weep for him in Ramah. And yet what's interesting is that these prophecies were actually fulfilled by the enemies of God. It was Caesar who forced Joseph to take Mary, nine months pregnant, over rough roads, 90 miles from Nazareth, where they lived, to their ancestral home in Bethlehem. It was because of Herod slaughtering the innocents that Joseph had to flee with Mary and Jesus uh, down to Egypt. And it was because Herod's son was as wicked as his father that the angel warned Joseph to continue north when they came back, not to stay in Bethlehem, but to go back into the land of Galilee. And of course, the weeping at Ramah had to do with all of the little boys that were murdered. So these seeming contradictions are actually like this dead reckoning position where we have various events and they all align perfectly to reveal the location of the Messiah's coming. When we think about the history of Bethlehem, of course, it's the story of, of four boys. We discover that Rachel gave birth to Jacob's last son, Benjamin, as they came to Bethlehem. And uh, this little boy was named by his mother, Benoni, which means son of my sorrow, because she died in giving birth to him. But Jacob renamed him the son of my right hand. Now, as we've noted, the Lord Jesus, as far as his humanity, had a mother but no father. And as far as his deity, had a father but no mother. His mother only saw as far as the cross, and she was pierced through with many sorrows. But his father sees beyond to the glory, and he renames him, if you will, Benjamin, the son of my right hand. Sit here at my right hand, he says. And so, first of all, we have the boy with two names. And then, secondly, we have the story of Ruth coming back from the land of Moab with her mother-in-law and coming to the town of Bethlehem at barley harvest time. And there's this wonderful love story where the Jewish kinsman redeemer takes as his wife, takes as his bride, this Gentile woman from Moab. What a beautiful picture this is of our Lord Jesus a gathering a bride from all the Gentile nations. And they had a little boy named Obed, which has the dual meaning of worship and service. And so we have the idea, not only of two names, but of two peoples, Jews and Gentiles, united in the kinsman redeemer. And then, of course, we come to David. This is the town of David. And uh, the, also the youngest son, the youngest son of Jesse. And he has two roles. He's the shepherd who becomes the king. And so the two names and the two peoples and the two roles, then we're introduced to our Lord Jesus with two natures. He is God and man together. And God has prepared the way so that Bethlehem is the perfect setting for the coming of his dear son. When we think about Bethlehem, the house of bread, where else would God send the manna from heaven, the food of God? Now, finally, the, the consummation of these miracles is, in fact, you and me. The reason for it all is because the Lord Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He was born to die. And so the last great miracle is the Redeemer's provision. Every one of us 
who has willingly made room for the Lord Jesus in our hearts has discovered the glorious truth that the one who was born at Bethlehem brings new life into us. We become also a dwelling place for God. What a marvelous thing this is, that he came the first time in his own body and now he lives in his mystical body. You are the body of Christ. Let me conclude with these beautiful words of the well-known carol, How silently, how silently, the wondrous gift is given, so God imparts to human hearts the blessing of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. This is the ultimate gift, the three great gifts that God has given to the human race. The Father gave the gift of his Son, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes on him should not perish but have eternal life. The Father gave the Son. And then the Son gave his life. The Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And then the Spirit gives us the very life of God, completes the circuit, and brings us into the fellowship of the divine persons. Three gifts in one, marvelous truth. And it all focuses on the little town of Bethlehem. So may God bless you in these days. May you look for opportunities to shine for Jesus in the darkness and to let people know glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, good will toward men. A Savior has been born who is Christ the Lord.